This morning we are going to be in Acts chapter 1. Last week we finished up in Luke, the last chapter of Luke. And we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. Imagine that I talked about and preached on the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday morning. That was creative, wasn't it? Very original, yes. However, I've been praying all week and struggling with what I was going to preach on. the All the way up to yesterday afternoon, I didn't have a clue. And late last night, I wasn't still 100% convinced. But having a great spiritual conversation with my daughter, Jeanna, and, and having prayed about it and spent this week in study, God's finally given me a direction to go this morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to keep talking about Jesus this morning. Oftentimes, once we hit Easter, we jump into the letters that are in the New Testament, or we talk about some Christian value or something to do with the Bible somewhere, because Jesus has died, He has risen, let's move on, is what we often take an approach to. But how often do you talk about between the time he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, what happened those 40 days? How many of you know all the, there is to know in Scripture about between the resurrection to the ascension? How many of you know exactly what happened and where to find it? Well, this is good. I got a whole room full of people who should be able to pay attention and learn something today because this is something we don't talk a lot about. We talk about he's risen from the dead, and then we go on to talk about other things. But Jesus did not immediately go to heaven after he rose from the dead. Now think about this. He very well could have. So why in the world did he not? I was watching the news this morning. And just like every morning, there is a breaking news story that has to do with gun violence. Gun violence is rampant everywhere south of us. It is not due to guns, it's due to sin, ladies and gentlemen, that there's always a news story on the, the news about somebody getting shot. It is because we are broken people and this world is filled with sinners and this world needs a Savior named Jesus to change the hearts and the minds of people to love people rather than shoot people. And this morning, what we see in our culture is a division. We see a culture that seems to be going south. I'm here to tell you it's because there is an enemy named the devil, named Satan himself, trying to steal, kill, and destroy. But we do have a solution. His name is Jesus. You know, we can look at the cross and we can see how our debt was paid at the cross. We can see the victory that Jesus won over death, hell, and the grave in the resurrection. But then what did Jesus do? Well, this is why I'm really excited about today. Because we find that Jesus does something in Acts chapter 1. And you can see it alluded to in, in the last chapter of Luke. But we're going to look specifically in Acts chapter 1 because it's written by the same author that wrote the book of Luke. Luke is writing this, and he is very detailed. And you will understand when I read this first verse what he's referring to. It's the Gospel of Luke. The first account I composed, Theophilus, that is the Gospel of Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to Wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? 
he said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Jesus was doing something from the very beginning of his ministry. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was talking about something called the kingdom of God. John the Baptist talked about the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of God is wherever God reigns. Let me define for you the kingdom of God. It's very simple. And I'm going to tell you, it is not heaven when you're looking at it biblically. You can see that Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is at hand. It simply means kingdom. There has to be a king. And if there is a king, it means he reigns. The kingdom of God is where God reigns. And in this culture and in this world today, God is not reigning. Why? Because he does not reign in the hearts of all the people. This is where the kingdom of God is found. When God reigns in the heart of His people, you will see a difference. It's not that you may or you could, but when the kingdom of God, when God the King of kings and the Lord of lords reigns in your heart, He calls the shots, you follow His will, you believe as He believed, you speak as He spoke, then in that moment, the kingdom of God is reigning right here in the present in your life from within. And so this kingdom of God is a major thing that we see Jesus talk about through his whole ministry. John the Baptist prepared them for. And before we get there though, let's talk about these 40 days. There are 40 days that Jesus showed himself to the disciples. We have the three days. He, he died on Friday and was put in the grave on the first day. He was in the grave all of the Sabbath, which is Saturday. He was in there the whole day. And then on the third day, on the third day, he rose from the grave. So three days he was in the tomb. Then for 40 days he showed himself to the prophets. We know a lot about that first day that he rose from the grave, right? There were women going to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away. We know that there were some disciples that ran to the tomb. We know there were two disciples on their way to Emmaus. You can see that in Luke where they were pondering and they were troubled and they were confused and Jesus shows up there, goes to their house, reveals himself to them. He goes to the disciples when they're in the upper room. All these things we know, but all that happened on the first day of the week. So what happened the rest of the time? I'm so glad you asked me that. Eight days later, and if you want to know where it's at, just take your eyes and look to the left in your Bible probably. Eight days later in John chapter 20, it says that in verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were together. And Jesus shows up in the room because there's this man by the name of Thomas who had heard from the disciples that Jesus was alive. And Thomas said, yeah, right. When I am able to take my finger and stick it into his hands or into his side, then I will believe. So eight days later, eight days later, Jesus shows up and Thomas is there. Thomas looks at him and Jesus says, well, Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving but believe. Thomas goes, yeah, I'm good. I don't have to touch it. You're real. This is the real deal. You are alive. We know that story happens in that 40 days. We also know following that, there's a story of how the disciples are at the Sea of Galilee. Now, why are they in Galilee? Because if you're wondering where Galilee is, you can look in the back of your Bible or Google a map of, of Israel during Jesus' time, and you're going to see Galilee is way north of Jerusalem. Why are they up there? Anybody know why the disciples were in the Galilean area? Because, by the way, that's where Jesus did the most of his ministry. Why were they up there? Jesus told them to go there. He sent word through, through Mary and the other, uh, to the disciples to say, you need to go to Galilee. So they're in Galilee, and Peter's hanging out one day. And you know what Peter said? You can find it in John chapter 21. He said, I'm going fishing. 
Anybody here love to fish? Peter said, I'm going fishing. I'm waiting on Jesus. I've been hanging out here. I'm going fishing. And the other disciples said, well, Peter, I'm going too. I'm going with you. Because that's what they knew. They knew about fishing, so they went fishing. And while they're out there fishing, they didn't catch much. And then Jesus calls from the shore and says, cast your net on the other side. And they catch this big fish. It, it's just like when they were called, some of them, to be disciples. And so all of a sudden, they realize it's the Lord. Peter jumps out of the boat, swims to shore. He don't wait on his friends. He gets to Jesus. They have a conversation on, on the shore. We know that happened in the 40 days. And this is where Jesus looks at Peter and says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? He said, of course I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then shepherd my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know that I love you. Then tend to my sheep. And so we know of those stories there in the book of John right next to you. What else do we know? There's not much left in Scripture for us to know those 40 days. Now, if I had been writing, I think I would have focused on that. Because, I mean, this guy is raised from the dead, and there's a big deal here. He's got something to tell us, I bet, because he's back alive. But you know what? We only find in one of the letters where it tells us that in one case, he appears to over 500 disciples at one time. But that's all that we really know about these 40 days. But I want us to dive into Acts chapter 1 because I think it reveals a couple of things as to why Jesus waited 40 days. I mean, because he could have just said, you know what, I'm going to heaven, I'm out of here. He could have done it on the first day, he could have done it on the eighth day, he could have done it on the 14th day or the 10th day. Why did he wait 40 days? Well, I think the first thing that we can see, and we can see this in verse 3. Verse 3 of chapter 1 of Acts says, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. You know what he was doing those 40 days? He was providing evidence of his physical resurrection. He was providing clear evidence that he had physically rose from the dead. We even read in one place where he ate fish. With the disciples in John chapter 21, you can see he's there and he has, he has some fish and some bread and they are there eating together. A spirit does not eat. Why is Jesus giving them many convincing proofs? Now when you read this in the original, this isn't just eyewitness accounts. This is absolute physical evidence to confirm Jesus is alive. It's not just a thought. It's not just an aberration. It is absolute Evidence that you could take to a court of law and present and prove he was alive. So he was providing these 40 days evidence that he had physically risen from the dead. The second one is this in verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of how many days? 40 days. And speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And he was speaking of the things concerning the what? The kingdom of God. For 40 days, not only was he presenting evidence of his physical resurrection, but he was also teaching them, he was teaching about the kingdom of God. Now you know the one thing I do not read here, have you ever considered this? Throughout the Gospels we read about blind men, we read about the lame, we read about the leper, we, we read about people demon-possessed, and what does God do? He heals them. We read nothing anywhere in Scripture where in those 40 days, Jesus performed a miracle for anybody. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that very curious. Because while he was here, before he went to the cross, he's healing people left and right, and people are coming to him looking for healing of some sort. And then... In the 40 days after his resurrection, we read nothing. It does not say here, and he was healing people. It says he was telling them about the kingdom of God. Here's something that tells me. The kingdom of God is vitally important. 
If the healing of people had been more important than the kingdom of God, then we would be reading that Jesus was healing people. But he wants us to know, the writer wants us to know, God wants us to know that what, what is more important than the healing of a physical body is the kingdom of God. Obviously, it could be talking about the kingdom of God in the future, which is heaven. And that new heaven and new earth we read about in Revelation, that will be coming down that John saw in the great Revelation. But I am convinced that in Daniel chapter 2, a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this great huge statue made up of, of four different sections and it had different metals and it had gold and silver and bronze and it had clay and that was mixed on its feet and he didn't understand what it was and he was asking for somebody to interpret it and finally this man came to him named Daniel. This man Daniel came to him and said, King, I know exactly what you dreamed and I know the interpretation. And so the king was excited and asked him to reveal to him what it meant. And so he began to talk about there are going to be four kingdoms. There's your kingdom and there's going to be three other kingdoms that's going to come. And they're all going to be destroyed and done away with. And he says this, verse 44 of chapter 2 of Daniel, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all of these kingdoms. But it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it, it crushed the iron, the bronze, and the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. Let me interpret that to you, well, for you real quick. The stone that was cut out of the mountain without human hands is the virgin birth, the God that was sent from heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the stone that the builders rejected. When he hit that great, great uh, statue, it crumbled and was destroyed. That stone is Jesus Christ. That sets up the kingdom that will endure forever. Ladies and gentlemen, that kingdom is the kingdom of God. And that kingdom doesn't begin when you reach heaven. It began the day the Holy Spirit entered into the hearts of men for the very first time. And the kingdom of God was established through Jesus Christ. Now there's going to be two phases. One is the present kingdom of God and the second one's going to be the future. When, when all of sin is done away with and the new heaven and the new earth, are, uh, they, they come and we are in that place. That is the reigning kingdom of God where there will be no weeping or, or crying, or sickness, or pain. But in the meantime, the kingdom of God is not so far away we can't grasp it in this moment. The kingdom of God is about the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God before the cross. Jesus talked about it after the resurrection. I submit to you that the kingdom of God was established by Jesus. It was built upon Jesus and it will be sustained by Jesus. That kingdom that endures forever is spelled J-E-S-U-S. -S, what he did to bring in the kingdom of God. That is what endures forever. So the kingdom of God must be important if Jesus addressed it at the beginning of his ministry, throughout his ministry, and even after he rose from the dead, he's talking about this kingdom of God. The, the other thing that I find very interesting about Acts chapter 1 is this. Why 40 days? Why not do it after 21 days? Or 23 days? Or just pick a random number that you like very much. How about 7? Seven? 7 is a, the number of completion in the Bible. Or... The eighth day, because the number eight is the number for new beginnings. It's a brand new beginning on the eighth day. Why didn't he go on the eighth? Why 40? Well, I can tell you this. The reason why it's 40 is because Jesus was fulfilling the Father's fixed plan. His plan was put into place not when Jesus was born. God didn't stand up there and go, well, you know i got to come up with a plan. This whole thing's a mess. 
you can go all the way back thousands of years and find how God fixed this in place. Why 40 days? I want you to remind you of something. Pentecost, which is what they are celebrating, did not begin after the resurrection. The celebration of Pentecost began after the exodus from Egypt. It was a celebration. Hang with me now. Listen. Pentecost was the celebration of the coming down of the law that God gave to Moses. How long was Moses on the mountain receiving the law from God? Forty days. Pentecost was the celebration of the coming of the law of the Old Covenant, of the Old Testament, coming down to people after 40 days of Moses being up on the mountain with God. Now these disciples are spending how many days? 40 days with this man named Jesus who is establishing a brand new covenant that that will be separate from the old covenant. Jesus addresses it in Mark chapter 2. You cannot take the gospel of grace and interpose it with the gospel of the law of, of, of the Old Testament. The two don't mix. They don't go together. You don't take new wine, stick it into old wine skins. You don't take a new patch of cloth and put it on, on an old piece of cloth. The new gospel, the new day of grace, the new life of the Holy Spirit living within you is what we see happening in the fulfillment of the day of Pentecost. You can't tell me that happened by accident. Jesus died on the very day of unleavened bread. He died on the day of atonement so that in those next 40 days, and as they wait and pray, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would come down from heaven, enter into the hearts of man, and they would be able to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Why 40 days? Because God wants to make it clear there's no other man who can do what Jesus did. There is no other way except through Jesus. And this thing was not by accident or happenstance. It was on design and purpose that God made it clear. Moses, you're getting the law that man cannot fulfill completely. You're here for 40 days. Here it is. Live by it. Sacrifice animals by it. Now Jesus comes along and for 40 days he's with the disciples. He's getting them ready. Now take this, disciples, and share it with the world. 40 days is significant because Jesus was fulfilling the fixed plan of God to bring about a brand new covenant into our life. 40 days is significant. How many days did Jesus spend before he began his ministry? How many days did he spend in the wilderness? 40 days he was in the wilderness. 40 days is important when it comes to preparation for what God has for us. God was preparing the disciples. They needed to make sure that Jesus was alive. He wasn't just a spirit. That evidence was there. Jesus was telling them about the kingdom of God. This one thing is more important than people being healed and all the other stuff because this will heal their souls. The kingdom of God is going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God began with continues with and is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Write that down. The kingdom of God began with, it begins with, it continues with, and it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I would say that it endures because of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not dependent upon you doing it right. The kingdom of God is completely dependent upon God Himself. So there is a new covenant, there is a kingdom of God that begins here with Jesus Christ and His work and the Holy Spirit coming and empowering the disciples to go and now deliver not the Ten Commandments, but the commandments of Christ. For it says in Matthew chapter 28, Go and make disciples, disciple all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age, to the end of time. I am with you as you do this. He says earlier in the verse right above that, All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. 
The kingdom of God's authority, empowerment, comes through Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our life. Not your theological education, not the answers you have when people ask you questions, but it's completely empowered, sustained, it begins, it runs off of the Holy Spirit, not you. So number one, don't be afraid of the kingdom of God. Don't be afraid to put that out there with people. They may reject you, but as Jesus said, they won't be rejecting you, they'll be rejecting me. They may say they don't like you, but what they're really saying is they don't like Jesus. They don't like what he has brought to the table before them. So the kingdom of God is all about the Holy Spirit. A time is coming when all things will be made new, it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. That day is in the future, but the present day of the kingdom of God is within our hearts and our lives as we live. The new covenant is solidified and distinguished from the old by the one thing that the Holy Spirit lives within us because of the grace of God and the work of Christ fulfilling the old covenant. That's the earmark between the new and the old. By the way, some of you may not know this. You may need to write this down. Testament is another word for the word covenant. So when you say the Old Testament, you're saying the Old Covenant. When you say the New Testament, you're saying the New Covenant. So within these 40 days, Jesus is solidifying and making sure these men of God are ready as He spends time with them speaking about and teaching about this kingdom of God. Moses didn't hear about the kingdom of God like Peter and John. Moses heard about the laws. You should remember the Lord your God. You should not use His name in vain. You should not steal. You should not kill. Most of us in this room would, would probably say, I'm doing pretty good with the Ten Commandments. I'm all right. What did you do yesterday? Because one of the Ten Commandments says, to Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The Sabbath is not today. It was yesterday in the context of when that commandment came out. Saturday is actually the Sabbath. So now you may be going, oh, no. I broke a Ten Commandment? I didn't know that. What am I going to do on next Saturday? Hold up. Because this whole thing is about there is a new covenant. There is a new, new establishment of the Holy Spirit living in us. And the things that Jesus told us we are to do. Do not try to take the grace of God and slam it into the Ten Commandments and say, well, if you're going to be close to God and do what God has asked you to do, you've got to do every one of the Ten Commandments, which is over 600 and something laws. You've got to rec rectify that. If you're going to obey one, you need to obey them all. If that is your establishment of making yourself right before God. Did you know that one of the commandments is you should not wear clothing of different materials? It should be 100% of something. 100% cotton, 100% polyester, 100% satin. I have no idea what, what this tie is made out of, but I can tell you one thing. I really don't care. I think it looks nice. It goes well with this shirt. And I'm not concerned that I'm breaking one of the laws in the Old Testament. Well, Pastor, I don't understand. You're saying we don't need to worry about that? That is not what I'm saying at all. The Old Testament is important. It points us to the need for Christ. There is guidelines in the Old Testament that really gives us a good foundation and establishment of how to live. But my salvation and my relationship with God is not dependent upon me following every one of the commandments in the Old Testament. It is dependent upon me letting God reign in this heart. For that is the kingdom of God. When the King of kings and the Lord of lords reigns in your heart and gives you direction in what you say, where you go, what you believe, how you act, then the kingdom of God is reigning here. And the Ten Commandments are not the one reigning. The difference is letting the Ten Commandments and the stuff in the Old Testament dictate to you how you live or letting Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, dictate to you how you live. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, not the Old Testament guide you. That's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and the Kingdom of God coming and being established forever. See, there's not going to be another wave. In the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit was given to dwell within us 
And now moving forward, that will always be the case. Did you realize before there were, there were lights and there were screens that God changed people's lives? That the Holy Spirit came and lived within people before there were automobiles? People would come to church. They would walk and ride horses. They would come and be changed by a holy and living God. Not because of all the fancy lights, but because of the Holy Spirit entering into their hearts and radically changing them. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the kingdom of God. Seeing that people are changed. This, all this stuff is minor compared to the Holy Spirit changing a person's life. The church needs to be about the kingdom of God more than its own kingdom. We need to stop focusing on how great things look. Now, it's important. It looks great. We worked hard around here to make things pretty. But let me tell you something. I would much rather see five people get saved and have the ugliest bushes out in the front of this church than have the prettiest bushes and have no one ever saved in this altar. I don't want the prettiest building. I want the most spirit-filled building the most impactful place for people to experience a holy and living God so that when they leave, they're different. We have got to be about the kingdom of God more than our kingdom. Now please, I hope nobody takes me out of context. We do a lot of work to keep everything working around here because there's a lot of stuff that breaks all the time. Kim has been planting flowers, and it is the prettiest I've ever seen it coming up to the church. And it makes me smile. I'm glad to see God working like that. But ladies and gentlemen, when we saw a heart change last week for Jesus Christ, that's the kingdom of God work. We need to be about the kingdom of God work. We can do this other stuff, but we have to focus on seeing lives changed. Did you know that whenever they said this, gather, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father, what the Father had promised. Which he said, you heard of from me, I've told you about this thing. For John baptized with water, but I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You will become connected and united. You will be identified with this thing called the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The prevalent view of the Jewish people during this time, because they read the Old Testament, was whenever the Spirit of God would move, then there would be a great restoration of Israel. Look at the book of Judges. Israel would be in a terrible place. They would have disobeyed God. They're crying out to God, Oh, God, help us. Everything's terrible. Then the Spirit of God would come upon, not in, upon someone. They would be the judge, deliver them from the evil one, the, the enemy, the evil that had come into their land. And they would rejoice. Yay! Then they'd go back to their old ways. And then they'd cry out, and the Spirit of God would land upon somebody. They'd deliver them from the enemy. And then they would come back. Yay! Everything's great. They believed that when the Spirit of God came, Israel would be restored. So it's not far-fetched that they misunderstood. It is just their thinking. The Spirit of God comes. The kingdom is restored. Did you know that this word restored carries with it something that's powerful? It's a renewing. It is the goal of the work of Christ. And it's not just for the people in Israel. It's for the whole world. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said, it's not for me to know the time. You know what he's saying? Time is not as important as what you need to be doing. God did not look at Moses and tell him time's important. He said, these commandments are important. You take these to my people. Jesus said to the disciples, you know what I've taught you. You know who I am. You know there's a kingdom of God and there's a gift coming, which is the Holy Spirit, to live within people. You go give that to people. See, I don't know where this came from. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit prompting me. We need to stop trying to change people. We need to let God do His work and us do ours. Our job is not to change anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Because once the Holy Spirit gets inside of somebody, they're going to change. 
There's going to be some things that's going to happen. They're going to begin to, to wonder. There's one lady I've been talking to lately in premarital counseling. Man, when you sit and talk to her, she spent her most of her entire life has been far from God, far from church, not wanting anything to do with Jesus. She came to know Jesus, and let me tell you something. She will sit there with, I've seen her with tears in her eyes. I don't understand why I waited so long. I have tasted this. This is incredible and amazing. What I have now, I never had all of my life, and it has made a difference in me. That is a testimony, ladies and gentlemen, that God is doing a work inside of her. You know, a lot of us look at people and we go, boy, if they would just wear a different shirt, I can't believe they're wearing that color. Or as my, my mama will look at me every time I see her before she says, she, she, she won't even say, I love you, son, it's good to see you. The first thing my mama says when she sees me, when you shaving that stuff off your face. She don't like my beard. We look at people and we see all the things we don't like about people. We have some people in our life that there are things about them we love about them. But we're always wanting to see people be like us or to change. What if we wanted to see people have Jesus and the Holy Spirit living in them as much as we want to see people change? What if we, sh we were trying to strive for that? John Calvin said, It is the task of the church to make the invisible kingdom visible. To take that which the world does not understand and bring it to life so they can grasp it and see it. They can taste it. They can hear it. The lady I was speaking about, one of the interesting things about her, she never understood Jesus, Christianity, the church, until she met this guy who embodied Jesus in her life. She said, it was so different, I just had to know more. Wow. That is where we all need to be. Here's what you need to do. The kingdom of God is so important, Jesus taught this to us in Matthew chapter 6. What we must do, number one, pray for God's kingdom to reign in the hearts of people. You got somebody in your life that's a problem? You got somebody in your life that there's some issues going on? Some people you ain't getting along with or, or they're treating you bad? Instead of praying for them to have a flat tire on the way home, pray for God's kingdom to reign in their heart. Instead of praying that their checking account will get all discombobulated in the electronic world and they'll, they'll have nothing and all their bills will be laid, why don't you pray for God's kingdom to fill their heart full with the riches of His grace and His mercy? And I guarantee you they'll treat you differently. So let's focus more on praying for the God's kingdom to reign in the hearts of the people. Alluding back to how Jesus taught us that, Matthew chapter 6. He said, when you pray, you are to pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom and your will is being done in heaven. Pray that it will be done in the hearts of people. It's coming through the Holy Spirit. So let's pray for God's kingdom to reign in the hearts of people. Second, tell people about how Jesus has changed my life. Tell people how Jesus has changed your life. I'm absolutely convinced that what, what, had it not been for Jesus Christ, instead of me standing before you in a church, you'd be visiting me probably in jail because I come from some DNA of some mean, ugly people. Because my mom and dad was changed by Jesus Christ, they lived differently. And I grew up knowing one thing, church. Church was important. We were going to go to church. It didn't matter where it was at. It didn't matter how wide the road was. And if it took us three hours to drive down a dirt road that was one lane, my daddy was going to find that church and we were going to go to it. He taught me the importance of the spiritual part of my life. He didn't grow up with that. 
But Jesus changed his life, and because of how Jesus changed his life, and my dad and my mom and their testimony, it changed my life. And my prayer is, is that my life will change someone else's life. See, the kingdom of God is not dependent upon you making it last forever, but Jesus has asked of us to share with people about the kingdom. As John Calvin said, we're to make the invisible visible. It could come in a simple question. It could come in the way you treat people. It could come in just an encouragement you give. But whatever it is, do not back away from making the kingdom of God greater in your life. Remember, the simple definition of kingdom is what? The kingdom of God, it's simply this. The kingdom of God is where God reigns supreme. If God reigns supreme in your heart, the kingdom of God is dwelling at its greatest within you. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? I hope not, because I ain't perfect. But the kingdom of God was Jesus' focus for those 40 days to get to the disciples so they would understand, so they could take it out to the world. And if Jesus would make it important, I think we should too. So this week, why don't you, over the next seven days, tell somebody about your testimony of how God has changed your life, how Jesus has changed your life. Share it with somebody. It may take you 30 seconds. It may take you a minute. Just randomly share it. Just put it out there and just mention it to somebody. And let God do His work for His kingdom. Pray with me. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You, God, for what Christ did. And how He gave to us a hope. How He gave to us something that's bigger than ourselves. A kingdom to be part of that has been here before we were even born. That a kingdom that is presently here on this earth through the Holy Spirit and the kingdom that will be lasting after we're gone. All throughout eternity, God, your kingdom shall reign. Lord, your word declares, we see this in Daniel as well, that you put into place every leader that is part of your will. And Lord, there are people in our lives that challenge us, push us, that make us upset, that causes things to come out of us that we don't like. But Father, for those who are dealing with that, I pray, God, that you remind them that, that you have put them there for a reason. Maybe it's to grow them. Maybe it's to change in them. Maybe it's to challenge them. Maybe it's to turn them into a different direction. Whatever it is, God, you got a reason to put people in our life, put people over us, put people in our government, so that your kingdom will grow larger. So, Father, help us be a part of that. Father, we pray that your kingdom will reign in the hearts of the people who can hear my voice right now. That, Lord, you will be in charge. That you will dictate what we think, what our views are, what we do, how we speak, how we treat other people. Lord, may you be the king of kings in our hearts and our minds. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that makes this possible. Lord, for the one today who does not know you, who has tried to just do church and be a Christian, Lord, I pray that today they be born again rather than just be a Christian. Pray the day that they will surrender themselves, surrender their sin to you, that they will let it go and let you wash over them your forgiveness and take it over their life. So, Father, today, all they have to do is ask you to forgive them and take over their life. So God, will you do your mighty work right now? It's in the name of Jesus we pray.